Would you remain standing for the reading of God's word? Our scripture reading comes from Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 12. Hear the word of the Lord. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. And, and as you're seated, I want to um, let you all know how thrilled I am uh, to introduce you to a dear friend, a dear brother, uh, Gabe Coyle. Uh, Gabe is going to be sharing from God's Word this morning. Uh, if you don't know Gabe, uh, that's, that's on you. That's your fault. But, but Gabe truly is a remarkable leader, pastor, preacher, um, beard developer. Uh, I have to live vicariously through other men's facial hair, but I am a big fan of Gabe Coyle. Gabe serves as our uh, downtown campus pastor, uh, and it's a joy to call him uh, my brother. Um, I truly believe Gabe, apart from the facial hair thing, even though he doesn't have a beard right now, you'll have one at the end of the sermon, I think. But, um, but Gabe is truly... Uh, My brother from another mother on so many levels. Gabe and I have a similar sense of humor, similar interests, similar stories. Um, But even on Monday, we we wore the exact same thing uh, to to work. So we showed up. We we didn't even plan it. And so we were that closely connected at the hip. But but I do love Gabe. Uh, He is a joy to serve with. Uh, Gabe and I actually had the joy of running the Chicago Marathon with uh, Tim Spanberg at our Shawnee campus together, which was a ton of fun. And one of my favorite moments, more than the race itself, was a text conversation we had after the race. Uh, Gabe texted us saying, hey, I was honored to run with you guys. But autocorrect said, I was a hobo to run with you guys. Which, which in and of itself is hilarious, but when you look at what Gabe looked like the day of the race, it's actually fairly accurate. Like, so... So uh, it is, it is I, am, I am hobo to have you here with us, Gabe, but, um, but I truly am. This man is, is a joy to me. He is what, what Proverbs 18 refers to as, there are friends that stick closer than a brother, and, and Gabe very much is that. So would you join me in welcoming Gabe Coyle? Get in. Get in. Just get, get in, in here. Get in. And I'd love to just pray for Gabe as we, as we continue on, so let's take a moment to pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active, that it speaks to us. Mm. And so, Lord, now in this time, we ask for your spirit to awaken us to the truth revealed in your word. And so, Lord, may the words of Gabe's mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. 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 Thanks, Reed. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Greetings from uh, all of your family and friends at the downtown campus. And I just wanted to give a quick update on how things are going downtown. Um, our team has been growing as we've been developing our staff team. There we are. We were, here's a little insider, you know, info to Christ community. We were shooting our Christmas Eve promo like this last week. So we just plan way out ahead. Some of you are not surprised at all, but there we are. God's really been bringing the right people to play as we continue out carrying our mission in the downtown sector there. Also, in the midst of that, we have been able to hire Kelly Cruz, who is an artist who's going to be navigating and leading kind of our gallery, the four-chapter gallery initiative. Some of you have come down on First Fridays and seen how we've engaged artists by presenting their work, helping emerging artists connect faith and work and become apprentices for Jesus in that particular field. And also some developments around the new space at 208 West 19th Street. We have officially finished our design documents and deconstruction, which is the first step for this particular project. We'll start in the next couple weeks with our hopes to be moving in mid-2020. So some exciting things. Really, really grateful for your generosity, your collaboration, your prayers as we carry on in this mission together to be a caring family of multiplying disciples, influencing our community and world for Jesus Christ. Now, as we turn to our text this morning, we're going to take a pretty serious turn, okay? And I want to begin 
by remembering something that happened here in Kansas this year. In January of this year, in a courthouse in Wichita, Kansas, three individuals who are part of a radical militia group were sentenced to a collective of 81 years for plotting the mass murder of Muslims on American soil. The FBI found a huge stockpile of weapons, homemade explosives, and phone recordings of them plotting to explode car bombs, as well as dip arrows in pig's blood as they chase down and murder Muslims. In their four-page manifesto, they explain why, their deep belief as to why this was so crucial for them and their work. And it had everything to do with them defending, quote-unquote, the Constitution and ensuring that the U.S. government would never allow any more Muslims on the U.S. soil. I feel like anymore, you and I are used to hearing radical beliefs be front page news. I mean, we live what? In post 9-11 world, post Boston Marathon bombing world, post white nationalist running down protesters world, post mass shooting after mass shooting. And as a society, we've come to see that there really are these radical beliefs that are dangerous, that need to be unearthed, need to be revealed as insane and stopped. But the question is raised, what about all these everyday beliefs? Really, the majority of what you and I believe and what others believe feels kind of harmless. For example, there are people who still believe that the earth is flat. I kid you not, like there's a whole documentary, if you're really bored, on Netflix about this growing movement of flat earthers. And at first I think, that's ridiculous, pretty harmless, but ooh, I wonder if globes are on sale at Hobby Lobby, right? There's certain things about beliefs that some way, shape, or form feel harmless. And so I begin, to, I begin to have a question, and maybe if you're anything like me, you've asked this question at one point in your life. What beliefs are essential? When it comes to following Jesus, what's, what are absolutely essential? Do we just need to have our ideas about Jesus down, that he lived, that he died, that he rose again, and maybe we'll go to the book of Romans and lift a particular verse and say, if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord, then I'll be saved. But what does that mean? Do our everyday beliefs matter? Or can we just have some ideas about Jesus in alignment with Scripture and be a quote-unquote kind person and that's good enough? Well, this important question, it's not new. It's a question that's been raised by God's people, not only from the time of Jesus, but from the time that God has been engaging the world. And that's why I'm so excited about our text this morning is because today we meet a pretty radical Jesus. He's not the laid back, everybody gets a gold star kind of Jesus. He comes with a sword sticking out of his mouth and he's ready to declare war. This is an intense message for the church. But let me back up for just a minute. If you're new, if you've just joined us and have been gone for a minute, we are walking through the first three chapters of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And in these first three chapters, we see that on a Sunday, the resurrected Jesus shows up to the Apostle John, and he has seven messages for seven historical churches across Asia Minor. And in these seven messages, Jesus has words, words of equipping, words of evaluation as to whether or not they are genuinely following him, and then words of encouragement to keep up the good fight until he returns. And while these seven letters are written to seven historical churches, they are also written for us as we long to be a church for the end of the world. Now, when we step into this third letter written to the church in Pergamum, Jesus shakes things up a bit. And what's so fascinating is that Jesus shakes up things over fairly ordinary, everyday beliefs. And this morning's message has a pretty serious tone. And so if you want to hang your hat, if there's one thing I want you to take away with you this morning, it's this. If we don't want to war with Jesus, we must surrender every false belief. If we want to be on the right side of history, if we want to be found alongside of Jesus in honor and glory rather than pitted against him, if we don't want war with Jesus, we must surrender every false belief. Belief. And as we walk through this third letter written to the church of Pergamum, we're going to rediscover why beliefs are so crucial to Jesus, and then simultaneously better understand how you and I can surrender our false beliefs and hold on to the truth. Does that sound good? Well, if you haven't already, would you please turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, and we are going to begin together 
in verse 13. So Jesus, he's got this sword of a tongue, sharp and double-edged, flinging. And this is the first thing he says, verse 13. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name. And you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Jesus begins with affirming this local church and that they're holding on to their belief in Jesus such that even Antipas would rather hold on to Jesus and declare that Jesus is Lord over against declaring that Caesar is Lord and he loses his life for it. You see, here's the deal with Pergamum, and it's really been in every case of these cities as we've come to see, is that Pergamum is a really patriotic city. And for them, patriotism usually entailed Caesar worship. Historians agree, historians agree that especially with Pergamum, it was a place that epitomized Hellenistic culture in its pursuits and especially in its architecture. If you were to go, you could go and see actually some of them, and they're actually strewn about the world now, interestingly enough, some of their architecture, some of these monstrous temples to false gods and goddesses like Zeus and Athena. When Augustus became the first emperor of the Roman Empire, it was Pergamum that was first approved to be the imperial cultic center of the East to worship Caesar as God. This is why Jesus is using this language basically of Satan's backyard. In the spiritual war, this is like the front lines between the forces of evil and God's people. And so right here, in this highly tentious moment, what does Jesus say? Look with me now at verse 14. But I have a few things against you. Good reminder that Jesus comes with challenge, not just off affirmation. He comes with rebuke to encourage life rather than just words of comfort. But I have a few things against you. You have some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. So Jesus comes affirming this church that they're holding on to Jesus, but they're not just holding on to Jesus. They're holding on to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which interestingly enough, if you go back to uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 6, we see what? Jesus says, I hate the works of the Nicolaitans. I hate it. Way to go, Ephesus. You hate it too. Um, But here in Pergamum, they're holding on to it. And Jesus says, listen, if you keep tolerating not just their works, but the very doctrine, the very systematic way of thinking that's informing their behavior, if you keep tolerating this, I'm going to come at war against them. Seems like a pretty intense thing. So let's figure out what in the world these Nicolaitans are believing and so teaching. It boils down to two main ideas. The common thread for both of them is this lackadaisical behavior. Fueled by a belief that it doesn't matter if, it doesn't matter if. Okay, here are the two two beliefs, basically, that summarize the teaching of the Nicolaitans. One, it doesn't matter if you engage in the idolatrous rituals of the day and so engage in these worship feasts towards these false gods, just as long as you know deep in your heart and in your mind the ideas about Jesus, that Jesus truly is Lord, you can go ahead and engage in those festivals. Reed talked about that a little bit last week in some of these common practices, right? The second key teaching of the Nicolaitans is uh, it doesn't matter what you do with your body. It doesn't matter who you sleep with outside of marriage. It doesn't matter what you do in terms of intercourse because, listen, all you need to know is the ideas about Jesus. All you really need to know is who Jesus is. If you can have those right ideas, your behavior can be just like every other citizen of Pergamum. And listen, Jesus hates this kind of compartmentalization where belief is one thing and behavior is nice and neatly put over in another quadrant of our lives. He hates it. That's the language here. If we look at the context in in Revelation chapter 2. And the church across the first century is wrestling with this. Now, some of you when you're hearing this may be thinking, hey, 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 Gabe, I thought the apostle Paul talked about Christians being able to eat meat sacrificed to idols. What's up with that? 
Well, write down two passages for further study. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, the apostle Paul's like, hey, if you're in the marketplace and someone's like, hey, this beef is grass-fed, you know, and it's also, you know, comes from idols. Well, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Or if you go over to someone's house for happy hour and they offer you beef tartare and it was also offered to idols, it's not a big deal. Just engage. Where it comes from isn't the big deal because we all know that these, you know, false gods aren't real. But you get to 1 Corinthians 10 and he's like, don't engage in the actual festivals because you're actually engaging in the worship of demons. So he does make a distinction. And the Apostle Paul is not alone here. When the Apostle Paul feels called to reach out to the Gentiles, if you look in the book of Acts, he says, hey, hey, I feel like God's uniquely positioned me to go and reach the Gentiles. And the Jewish leadership of the church of the day in Acts chapter 15, verses 20 and 29 says, go in God's grace, Paul. But there are two things. As we see God working, as he promised throughout the Hebrew scriptures to reach the Gentiles, there are two things, really, that every Christian, whether they are Jew or Gentile, in every pagan context need to hold on to. Guess what they are? Don't engage in these religious festivals and don't engage in sexual immorality. And that's exactly what the Nicolaitans are attacking here. And the reason that Jesus is so enraged in an appropriate place of justice and holiness at what the Nicolaitans are doing isn't just because it's a huge danger in the first century in disrailing or dismantling Christian faith. It's because it's been an issue for God's people in every century. This is why he connects it to Balaam. Now, hang with me here. This is important. So if you go back to Numbers chapter 21 through 25, Balaam is a prophet of sorts, but he's not a part of the nation of Israel. Somehow, we don't know how, he's able to foretell what's happening and what's going to happen. And so the king Balak of the Midianites in the land of Moab says, Hey, Balaam, I want you to come and I want you to curse the people of Israel as they're entering this land. Because I know what you say actually happens. And Balaam comes and he's like, Listen, Balak, I can't curse them. God's doing something. Like, and he's going to bless his people. And over and over again, they have this debate, like Balak's like, well, what about if you stand over here? Same thing. Doesn't matter where I stand. I got to, you know, God's going to bless his people and he's going to do some damage to you. But then you get to verse 30, or chapter 31 and you begin to see the treachery of the teaching of Balaam. He says, listen, God's going to bless his people. But one thing you can do, here, here, check this out. Send in your daughters, exploitation right here, right? Send in your daughters, to seduce the people of Israel into sexual immorality and then guide them into the worship of Baal. Then their God will turn against them. And that's what happens. They engage in sexual immorality, begin to engage in these ritualistic feasts toward Baal, and God in His holiness sends a plague upon the nation of Israel. And the only remedy to their rebellion is death. And this is so crucial because in our text, what's a predominant theme? The sword. And when you're reading in Numbers 21 through 25, and when you get to Numbers 31, we see that Moab falls by the sword. Balaam explicitly falls by the sword, and even some of the people of Israel die by the sword. This feels like an extraordinarily intense judgment on the surrounding nations and upon God's people. And it all stems from false belief. You see, this is why Jesus takes belief so seriously. Because belief is where the war for the world is waged. And Jesus is ready to do battle. And by belief, I don't mean ideas, okay? You see, ideas are powerful, but belief can move mountains. Belief is what we hold. This is where you see this theme of holding on to, right? It's what we hold to be true and beautiful and real about the world, that it actually influences how we act in the world. Ideas, here's another way to look at it, ideas we can dissect, beliefs they direct. And as a 21st century white westerner, I got to be honest with you, I really wrestled with this text. I was like, come on, Some of these beliefs, like we got to have a little wiggle room, but Jesus, this is one of the most intense passages in these letters. Thyatira was also pretty intense, but this one is also extraordinarily intense. And it's because Jesus sees the danger of false beliefs and how they shape our world. Here are three reasons, okay? Three reasons why false belief is so dangerous. The first is this, false beliefs, they infect through the heart. 
Satan across the pages of Scripture and plenty of times is called the father of lies. And the way in which he engages false belief is never head on. And that is meant to be very intentional language. He seduces our desires. He grabs a hold of the heart and the mind follows. We begin to feel this cultural or personal pressure. Then we're offered an avenue of escape. And then we're given this misapplied compassion that it's going to be okay. Of course you needed to take this way of escape. Of course, of course. You see, false belief is never intentionally believed because we think it's false. We always think it's true. We always think it's necessary. We always think it's important. And you can almost imagine the Nicolaitans in that moment saying, listen, listen, Jesus died for you because he loves you so much. And Antipas died because he refused to bow the knee to Caesar. But listen, listen, more of us are going to die, but Jesus knows our hearts. So just engage in the festivals, but know that Jesus is Lord. Engage in immorality, because I know it's really hard to be pure, but you know what? Jesus knows your heart. If he loves us that much to die for us, none of this really matters. Just believe what he did. Listen, when we misplace truth, misplace compassion is its foundation. Or in the words of Pastor Tim Keller, what the heart wants, the mind finds justifiable and the hands find doable. Post hoc justification is so crucial in the ways in which Satan begins to lure the people of God into false belief. So false belief, it infects through the heart. But then secondly, it informs destructive behavior. False belief cultivates or leads to behaviors that destroy ourselves, dehumanize others, and defame the name of Jesus, even when it feels so right. Listen to the wise sage of Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. It feels so right, but it leads to death. How many times have we done something feeling so convinced it was the right step forward, and whether minutes later or years later, we look back and we see the carnage that we caused? It doesn't take but a minute to peruse the sexual revolution, and its worship of absolute freedom, the God of freedom, and to see the carnage of child abuse, of broken marriages, of sex trafficking on the same level of rise as pornography addiction. I mean, on and on the list goes, all in the worship of freedom. Even though it doesn't have a face, it does have a name. And we too engage in those same rituals. And listen, Jesus will not sit by while death reigns the world. And when pastors or when leaders begin to promote false belief, Jesus will not sit idly by for long. Because here's the third reason why false belief is so dangerous. False belief imagines a false vision of the world, a competing vision of the world. And there's only one vision of the world that will ultimately stand true. That is the message of the book of Revelation, is it not? That God's kingdom is breaking in through Jesus and his vision. And every other competing vision, although it feels so right and may even go underneath the guise of compassion, leads to exploitation, pain, defamation, and destruction. So what do we do? How many of you have seen the Spider-Man movie Far From Home? Anyone out there? Yeah, a few of you. Way to go. Awesome. Um, I just recently watched it with my parents. Yeah, I still watch movies with my parents. My parents didn't want to watch it, but we did it anyway because I was like, it's for a sermon. Um, <clears throat> it's really important. Sure, sure, Gabe. Whatever. Um, in this, you know, this particular one, Peter Parker, that is Spider-Man for those of you who are catching up. Peter Parker has a new foe in town, Beck, and he is a disgruntled Stark Industries employee who was, what, a holographic illusions specialist. And how does he come to seek to fight the world? It isn't with brute force, but it's by creating a distortion of reality such that we use our own forces against ourselves, confused as to how we can't fight back. And the only way, the only way that Spider-Man is able to win over Beck is by dismantling the illusion for him to know the truth and help the world see the truth. So how do we do this? How do we dismantle the illusions in which we find ourselves? How do we, in the words of Jesus, repent? Because listen, this is really, really important. The stakes are really high because when you get to Revelation 19, the same language of Jesus is used there. 
He comes in on a white horse at the end of time, covered in blood, and we're not sure if it's his from the cross or it's the new blood of his enemies, but he has a sword coming out of his mouth, and by the end of Revelation 19, the corpses of his enemies lay astrewn with the birds of the air coming to feast on the carrion. It is intense. You and I, the stakes are high. And listen, when it comes to repentance, this is what repentance is. It's always surrender. You see a lot of this language, once again, of holding on. They're holding on to Jesus, and then they're also holding on to this false teaching. Repentance is surrendering these false beliefs, letting them go, and holding on more tightly to Jesus. But here's the really tricky thing with belief. This is why I was wrestling so much. You and I, we can't control our belief. I can't go up to Reed and say, hey, buddy, I'll pay you a million bucks to believe you have the powers of Spider-Man. A million dollars, just believe it. He's like, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe that we can win, right? Like nothing he can do is ever going to get him to that point to force belief. If he takes a polygraph test, it's going to reveal that he doesn't actually believe it in the depths of his heart. So how do we do this? Blaise Pascal, a brilliant uh, mathematician and philosopher there in the 1623 to 1662, brilliant, brilliant guy says, listen, we can't control belief. None of us can, but we can engage in in intentional practices that cultivate true belief and surrender false belief. So what are those? I'm going to give you three quick practices to end our time this morning that we actually see anchored in our text, that Jesus gives us guidance on, that he models brilliantly. Three intentional practices you and I can engage in surrendering our false beliefs and so better hold on to true belief anchored in Jesus. And here's the first one, okay? Identify to whom we're listening. We need to identify to whom we're listening. Jesus does that here. He's like, hey, you guys are listening to the Nicolaitans. He names them. And they, just like so many today, felt like they had this unique track into God's work in the world that chafed against the biblical witness and the historical witness of the church. Identify to whom we're listening. What would it look like this week if you engaged alongside of your other spiritual disciplines, an input audit. Thinking through all the different voices to whom you're listening. When you're driving to work, what music are you listening to? That is like one of my greatest weaknesses. I love a good jam, okay? But I often am just like, oh, this beat is off the chain. But I don't always listen to the lyrics. And yet I suddenly find myself with particular passions or desires. And I'm like, where is this coming from? I've been experiencing all these different inputs that have been encouraging these desires in ways that I haven't even imagined. What podcasts are you listening to? What books are you reading? What blogs are you engaging? Listen, we have like, on the best of months, four hours together, roughly. And then some of you are really trying hard to be in your scriptures daily, right? But the reality is, here's another thing. For some of us in here, we're watching more than an hour a day of news. And then we come to the text with either MSNBC or Fox News, and we come right in here and we go, okay, that doesn't fit MSNBC. Okay, that doesn't fit Fox. And that's one of the reasons why the church is so polarized, because we're listening to all these other voices out there and using them as the litmus test to this, rather than this being the litmus test to all these other voices. You and I, we need to be discerning when it comes to the endpoint inputs in our lives, rather than just nameless or, or, or consuming these voices. The Apostle Paul himself, in the book of Acts, when the Bereans are like, hey, hey, Paul, I know you're an apostle, so thanks for coming and teaching us, but we're still going to go fact check you in scripture. What does the Apostle Paul say? He's like, good, way to go, Bereans, you get it. I don't care who comes to you. If it doesn't align with God's word, throw them out. Stop listening to them. Do we and have we been intentional to identify to whom we're listening? And then secondly, this is really important. Name the world they're imagining. Name the world they're imagining. Jesus does this with the Nicolaitans, doesn't he? He says, the Nicolaitans, you know who they're like? They're like Balaam. And you know what his end was? He dies by the sword. And I'm coming with my sword, so if you want his end, if you want to be at war with me, follow him. He names it. The voices that you're listening to, what is the picture of the world that they're painting? What's their end? What's the goal? Who's included and why? Who's excluded and why? So important. 
You know, it wasn't too long ago, I was sitting down with a coffee with a, a young woman who was attending the downtown campus at the time, and she said, you know, Gabe, I haven't been to church in a while because I'm in a period of deconstruction. And I said, amen, that's great. There are certain beliefs and ideas that we need to deconstruct because they have no anchoring within biblical framework, so this is a really healthy practice. And then I said, but let me give you one caveat, rather two. You can't spend the rest of your life in deconstruction or you'll come to the end of your life surrounded by ruins. And when you go about rebuilding your city, the place in which you find yourself, make sure that when you build this city, it's not a city that you're so comfortable in, that feels so great, but you're unsure as to whether God can live there. Because listen, a city where you feel extraordinarily comfortable, but God will never visit is nothing more than a really cozy hell. What's the end that this worldview, what, what, what the people we're listening to, where are they taking us? Because Jesus' vision of the world is abundantly clear. Look in Revelation 7, and what do we see? People from every tribe and tongue. And we see people who have died to self and died to the world. That's why they get these white robes. And so in other words, we often talk about diversity and unity, but it's diversity, chastity, and unity. Don't forget the middle one. Diversity, God from every tribe and tongue. But they're sold out exclusively to Jesus, and it shapes their life in every nook and cranny covered in the grace of God. Who are we becoming when we're listening to these voices? So when you've done this input audit, I would encourage you to do a behavioral audit. When you're done listening to the voices that are speaking into your life, do you see evidences of the fruit of the Spirit, of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Or when you're done being engaged with these various inputs, do you rather see the works of the flesh? What are those? The Apostle Paul talks about these as well in Galatians 5. They are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger. That one's there. Rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. That's a long list. Who are you becoming when it comes to whom you're listening? And then thirdly, after you've identified, after you've named, thirdly, commit to the church. You see, the church in Pergamum, they were silent when they needed to speak up. They were self-serving when they needed to be sacrificial. They were holding on to something else other than just Jesus. But you know the reason why there's so much hope here in the midst of Pergamum? That they won't indeed feel the sword? You know why there's so much hope? Because they continued to gather together when Jesus indeed, indeed did speak. When God spoke to this church, they were there. There's something unique about the people of God gathering underneath the word of God to sharpen one another on the path of God. They understood that to hold on to Jesus, you've got to hold on to the church. You can't just walk around with a bloody head. You need to embrace the whole body. So in order to be serious about truth, we need to do a commitment audit when it comes to the church. That's a lot of audits. I know. Just hang with me. And I also know that the church has a pretty mixed report, and it's done some pretty outright terrible things. Often, often, often when you look around history, when it's done some of the worst, it's because it's embraced these false ideologies and was seduced by money, power, or sex. And it led to destruction this world over in ways that Jesus wanted nothing to do with. That's why we here at Christ Community, we take it so serious, this stewardship of God's word and the truth that he's entrusted to us. Every Monday... You saw Reed and I in our matching clothes. <laughs> Every Monday, we seek to get together, and we talk about one week out and two weeks out, and we dive through the text together. What's the original author seeking to communicate to the original audience that has word to say for every audience throughout time? And sometimes someone might say, hey, I think this is what this means. No, that's a really stupid idea. Don't ever say that, especially not in front of people. Please don't ever do that. You're going to destroy our church. Ah, okay, good. Some healthy accountability, right? Right? Just want to make sure. 
And then simultaneously, when we're done writing out a full manuscript, yes, a full manuscript, we share it with other thoughtful people at our campus. For me, I share it with folks who aren't in my generational zone, people who are not in my ethnicity, and people who are not my gender. Not be because they're somehow... The the truth isn't inherent in the text. No, the truth is embedded in the text from an original author to an original audience, but I also have a cultural situatedness that makes me blind to the beauty and the riches of the truth of God's word. And we need each other to engage the beauty and the depth and the width of God's word. So what would it look like for you to do a commitment audit? What's that next step for you? Is it to, to jump into a community group in January? Is it to become a member of this church? Is it to serve? As our church continues to grow, so do our opportunities to grow in Christ-likeness in service for the one who came not to be served, but to serve, and so calls us to do the same. Maybe it's a next step of generosity where Jesus calls us to be generous in all ways, but especially when it comes in its commitment to the local church. What is that commitment audit calling you to take the next step? If this is the place where God has entrusted his truth uniquely when we gather in his name, how are you committing to truth by committing to the church? But I want to be very clear, this is a really costly commitment. False belief is pretty easy. Truth, it takes a ton of work. I mean, when you look in our text, who's the one person that Jesus praises? The dead guy, Antipas. He's like, he had it right. But what about the Nicolaitans? They're sitting pretty. They've basically cut out everything that will cost them something there in Pergamum. At that moment, they look great. Antipas looks terrible. But there's a day coming, Jesus says, where he'll pull back the curtain. And the upside down kingdom will be set right side up. And what we believe today will have radical ramifications for our eternity. So we can either hold fast to our false beliefs and so find ourselves at war with Jesus or we can surrender our false beliefs as painful as it may feel and conquer with him is the invitation we're given. Nikao, to have victory with him. We can either enjoy these glorious feasts because we've embraced the values and the goals of the world that surrounds us, or we can center our lives on Jesus and he becomes our litmus test of all things and so experience holding on to this hidden manna that the rest of the world doesn't know of but one day will be revealed. We can know of great and glorious feasts and acceptance and places of prominence. We can make a name for ourselves or we can find ourselves having a hidden name because it's hidden in Christ and when he returns, as we see in Revelation 19, his name will be revealed this world over and we will finally we be seen for who we are and we are his you see the end of revelation reveals that the world will end in upheaval that's the end but we long to be a church for the end of the world May we be the kind of people, the kind of place, the kind of church that surrenders false beliefs and so in the everyday, ordinary beliefs, find victory by faith. May that be true of us. Let's pray. And Lord Jesus, I would love to pray in the way that you've taught us to pray as we seek to hold on to that. For those who are in Jesus, would you join me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the glory and the kingdom and the power forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.